surrounded by beautiful women, smoking filtered cigarettes, driving a Cadillac convertible. This was the sexy life I wanted. <laughs> it was the life of Perry Mason, the TV lawyer I watched in the 1960s show as a child. And when I grew up and became an attorney myself, I got the life that Perry had, except for the Cadillac. But I did try to be Perry Mason in my very first job as a Navy judge advocate. That's a picture of me on the steps of the United States Supreme Court. Now, in the Navy, it comes as no surprise that the captain of the ship has total command over everyone on the ship and everything that goes on the ship as well. And when the captain of a ship walks into a room, everybody stands at attention in recognition of his ultimate authority. And when I was in the Navy in the 1990s, being openly gay was a reason to get kicked out of the service. And in my very first case, I represented a lesbian who, even though she was an excellent sailor, the captain wanted her off his boat. He wanted her discharged. Now, the way the discharge system works in the Navy is the captain appoints three of his subordinates to hear the merits of the sailor's case, to essentially answer the question, should this sailor be kicked out? Now, in this system, there is an inherent conflict of interest because the board is supposed to be impartial in deciding the sailor's fate. But at the same time, they want to please the captain who not only writes their work performance evaluations, but also recommends them uh, for promotion. And when we had our case, the captain decided to make a surprise appearance. And when he walked into the boardroom, and we all had to stand up at attention, including my client, as he came to testify against her and tell his subordinates how badly he wanted her out of the service, I wanted to shout out, this is wrong. And when the board predictably voted to discharge my client, I cried for three days. This is something Perry never prepared me for. <laughs> but when I reflected on my actions, when I tried to figure out why I didn't shout out at the obvious injustice that was unfolding before me, I realized that my fear had talked me out of it. And when I reflected on what could I do, perhaps, to make courage a reflex, I thought, could I teach myself to make it an automatic response? Now, recent neuroscience research out of UCLA says that our brains actually may be hardwired for altruism. That is, it's impulse to run inside of a burning building to save others at great risk of our own personal safety. Courage, on the other hand, is being consciously afraid and acting anyway. And when I looked for a template to generate courage, I looked to history, where ordinary people did extraordinary things. In the 1950s, the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott was successful because of ordinary cooks and teachers and laborers who walked for 381 days. But those small steps toward racial integration, 60 years hence, is the reason that we got our first African-American president. In the 1960s, in the face of relentless harassment by the New York City police, ordinary drag queens fought back in a bar named Stonewall, sparking the gay liberation movement. And then 50 years hence, the Supreme Court ruled same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states, and we can all witness our trans brothers and sisters winning national awards of recognition today. In the 1970s, we saw women, ordinary women, demanding equal treatment and opportunity both inside and outside the home. And their collective voices, 40 years hence, gives us the first woman presidential nominee of a major political party. The common denominator in these successful social justice movements is that ordinary people like you and me, minimizing our fears to maximize our commitment to a goal larger than ourselves.
And it's with great pleasure that I'm here today to share with you at TEDx Harrisburg three suggestions to make courage your habit, especially when speaking out on the issues of race, gender, and sexual identity. Now, you actually do not need to have anything in common with people in order to join their movement for social justice. But it does help to be an effective advocate if you are authentic. So step number one in making courage your habit is to surround yourself with diversity, such as these balloons. We call this sitting at a different lunch table. Now, earlier this year, I was speaking to a great group of seventh graders in Bettendorf, Iowa. And I was telling them that they could be the change they wanted to see in society today if they would take action. If they went to lunch and sat at a new table uh, with people who were different from them in order to make new friends. And I could tell from the look on their faces, I should have just said, Will you all please just go to Mars for lunch and bring me back some French fries? <laughs> it's the same look that adults have when they're a minority in a new social setting. The questions you ask, will I be liked? Will I be accepted? Will I get the inside jokes? It's the questions that you only can answer by taking direct action and doing it. So stretch yourself, make a choice, go beyond your level of comfort. Go to a black church and attend a Juneteenth celebration. Go ahead, attend a gay pride parade. Speak at a women's history event. Whatever you do to create social justice, you actually have to do it. So play musical chairs at your lunch table or dive into the ocean of diversity. Believe me, you won't regret it. Step number two in generating courage and making courage your habit is that you have to be passionate about justice. Now, really, how do you go about that? When I talk to first-year law students and I ask them, how would you approach defending the worst among us, those who harm the defenseless? Many of the students say, oh, I could do that because everybody deserves a defense. And I quickly challenge these students and say, Really? Is that the type of generic defense that you would want your loved ones to receive? And virtually unanimously, they all reply, absolutely not. So how is it that we can bridge the divide between indifference to passion? And the answer is, is you have to find in your heart some emotional hook for what justice means to you. So for an example, when I was a criminal defense attorney, and this is a picture that my son drew of me in court when, I, when he was nine years old. <laughs> I always thought of myself as a line of defense between the people and government overreach. And regardless of the case before me, I got my emotional juice in my heart by constantly challenging the government. How dare you lock up innocent people for 10, 20, 30 years? How dare you execute the hapless after condemning them as children to a lifetime of misery in communities long neglected? So for you, you have to spend some quiet time with yourself. What does your heart tell you? Justice is. Your heart is a much greater motivator, of course, than your thoughts. Perhaps it's the fact that you care about children and the fact that babies are not born racist, sexist, or homophobic. Perhaps justice for you is to teach children to see people as just people. Step number three in making courage your habit is that you have to hold institutions accountable for giving due process to everybody. Now, studies show that people involved in the legal system can accept the outcome of a case, good or bad, as long as they feel that the process treated them fairly. And fairness, of course, is the bedrock of American democracy, where all men are created equal. But true social equality in America has been perverted by our history of institutional discrimination. Today, those who discriminate they live in the past. 
and they are clearly outnumbered in the present. But it is incumbent upon us to hold our institutions accountable, our schools, our houses of worship, our elected officials, to root out those who would discriminate, to ensure that everybody gets due process under the law and is treated fairly. And should you do that, you will give voice to those who may not otherwise have one. Your decision to speak out for social justice will define the rest of your life. Start small, start today, stay patient, write a letter, meet a new friend, speak out at work. One person can change the world and you are that person. And should we join together in the fight for equality, it will be a fight that we will win.